National Academy of Science has now just convened a panel to investigate what they call life as we don't know it. Because we're getting a handle, really, with our genomic studies and our imagination on life as we do know it, the three domains of life on our planet, the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryons. But what about chemical types of life as we don't know it? What about silicon life? I mean, it's in TV every night. What about types of molecules of life that seem impossible to us? And yet the more we think about these and the more chemists look at these, we have to admit that there are probably very few ways to make life. Carbon-based life may be the only type of life. Something like DNA is probably necessary for life. And how many ways can you make DNA? The language could be changed. The chirality could be changed. But it may be that when we go out in a space, we'll find other life and be surprised how similar it is to life on planet Earth, that chemically there may not be an infinite variety of ways to build it. Evolution, planetary conditions, of course, will be varied. But maybe when we get to the heart of life, it will not seem so unfamiliar to us. Now, one of the aspects of life that is clear to all of us and much more clear to some of us than others in the audience is that it ends. I don't think there's anyone here who has not felt the loss of someone. Our country obviously felt an enormous loss on 9-11. Death is part of our life. We know about it. But how often do we seriously think about the end of the Earth? And so what I'd like to do tonight is get away a little bit from rare Earth, which is really about space. Rare Earth is looking at, in space, how many geographic areas are suitable for habitable planets. But let's ask about time now. Instead of asking about special places in the universe, let's ask about special times and any planetary lifespan. Now, I'll start out this talk with a homily, if you will, that will unsettle some of you, and others will not know what I'm talking about. There are those of you in the audience who go to your doctor maybe every year, every two years, and that doctor does things to you. They weigh you, and they take your blood pressure, and they get your heart rate and your pulse, and sometimes they do much worse things to you. But all those things, and they write it in a manila folder with some paper behind it. It gets thicker and thicker and thicker. If you have the same doctor, it gets thicker and thicker and thicker. What is that doctor doing? That doctor is predicting when you're going to die. Now, you know what I'm talking about, those of you over 40 or 45 or whatever. You teenagers, you have no idea. The doctor then is saying, oh, you're going to grow to be so tall. You're going to be handsome and beautiful and smart and all this stuff. But for the rest of us, it's, oh, five more pounds. Your cholesterol has gotten worse. And all these lines are going down. And you can raise them up a little, but sooner or later, they intersect some terrible flat line that becomes you, the flat line. Well, that's an awful thought. You know, at least it's an infinite number of years away for all of us, I'm sure. But nevertheless, it will come and get us. Well, that is exactly, for the first time, what astrobiologists are doing to planet Earth. That if astrobiologists are the doctors of planets, the Earth is now being looked at in that type of way. And instead of going year by year, what astrobiologists are doing, because they can't really look forward, although we will by the end of this talk, they can look backward. And they can use geological evidence to take ancient heartbeat, ancient blood pressure, the equivalence thereof. How has the Earth changed through time? Is the Earth that young kid, and the astrobiologists are saying, well, we got 20 billion species now, we're going to have 40 billion in another 10 million years. Or is there a different sense to it? Is the Earth that 45-year-old creature or that 60-year-old woman or that 80-year-old man who is descending quickly? And the sad story is that we're seeing that the Earth is far nearer the end of at least animal life than its beginning, that the Earth as a habitable world is on the downhill slide, that this planet is no longer in its youth. It's in quite old age and that the end of animals is going to come much sooner than any of us think. So with those pleasant thoughts, let's begin with the first slide. <laughs> I expect to sell three copies of this book. <laughs> first slide, please. All right. We look at this beautiful world that we have. We see its attributes. We know it's water covered. It has continents. It has all this great stuff. 
And we might ask ourselves, how many of these planets are there out in space, which is obviously one of the most important questions. But the second question is, how long will this planet look this way? How long has it looked this way? And how long until we look at planet Earth that we no longer see oceans? Or we no longer see these white clouds, which are water vapor? How long until we see a quite different planet? If we think about space, as I said, now let's think about time. This is a picture from the very start of the Earth. That's the moon in the back room very close. We see a world that's very different. We did this on purpose. But this really is an interesting point of view because we're beginning to think that the end of the Earth might look much like its beginning. So what is the end of the world? Here's a list just that comes out. Is it your life? When I say, oh, my God, it's the end of the world, well, you know, is it me or is it my job or is it whatever? We use that term quite often. Might it be the end of human civilization or human species or life or the planet itself? And it turns out that the Earth has many, many ends. And what I'll try to show in tonight's talk is that, indeed, it has many ends. Oops, let's go back one. Can I go back? Yes. Well, this is what probably the first life looked like. We really do believe that bacteria or bacteria-like creatures were indeed the very first life. And if you look at the history of the Earth, we realize that this type of life was present at least 3.5 billion years ago. It may have been present much before that. It could be that life, as many of us believe, is relatively easy to produce. It could be that life on Earth started multiple times and then was erased totally by the period 4.2 to about 3.8 billion years ago called the heavy impact bombardments. Then life arose, was wiped out, arose and wiped out, arose and wiped out over and over and over again. It could be that life never even started on the planet, that we're Martians or Venusians. Earth, perhaps, was a very bad place 3.5 to 4 billion years ago for life to start. But one of the interesting things about life on planet Earth, it didn't stay in that category. It moved up to this. It went from single-celled to multi-celled, and then from multi-celled to diverse and rich and complicated with millions of species. There's 1.6 million species defined, but nobody thinks it's that few. Perhaps there's 10 million species on the planet. Perhaps there's 30 million species but we have a variety of them and a variety of complexity. And what a lot of us think is that worlds where the complexity is this rich may not be as common as Hollywood thinks. So the interesting question to us now deals with time in the sense that are those factors which allow the rise of life, or in this particular case, even a subset of life, metazoans, animal life like us, are they the same that allow it to live for some period of time. The chemical conditions necessary to produce life are one subset of conditions. But how can we keep life going on a planet for very long periods of time? And this is, I think, the most interesting aspect of our planet, is that although life began 3.5 billion years ago or earlier than that, we didn't get animals till a half billion years ago. So we had three billion years between building bacteria and building things that we call animals. Even simple animals did not arrive until the Cambrian explosion or just before it. So why was that long lag there? And the long lag was necessary for our planet to build up oxygen in its atmosphere. That oxygenation took a very long period of time to take place. And during that long period of time, what kept us going was the fact that the Earth never got too hot. It never rose above 100 degrees centigrade. It never got too cold. It never froze entirely. The snowball Earth doesn't have a complete freeze to the planet. We never went runaway greenhouse. And that may be why the Earth is rare, is that we have a planetary thermostat. It's equivalent to the warm bloodedness within you. If you get too cold or you get too hot, you're dead. And our planet stayed at a nice, equable temperature, allowing the presence of liquid water for over 4 billion years. That's what I think makes the Earth rare, is this planetary thermostat. When we lose that thermostat, and we will, the ends of the Earth will soon follow. Time, geologist time, and I throw this up because you've seen this sort of wrinkle in time. The scale on the right is what we call the Phanerozoic. This is when all fossils are found. But the Phanerozoic is just one tiny slice. Really, the four and a half billion years of Earth history are just unbelievable in the length. The timing, the years that have gone by until metazoans could arise. So really, if you're looking at age of a planet, our planet, let's say, is going to live to be 100. 
it had its animals at about age 80. An old, old man or an old, old woman gives rise, gives birth to animals right near the end. Once animals appear, this is from Jack Sapkowski and his diversity curve, things take off like crazy, diversification increases, and it's nice to see that it seems like we're at a point where we have more and more species through time. But sooner or later, 